Ich bin heute in Antwerpen auf einem ziemlich abgefahrenen Gebäude und von dem aus sehen wir wunderbar die Brauerei Sef hier unten. Die gehen wir jetzt besuchen. Cheers. Cheers. <lacht> The name of the brewery is Antwerpse Brau Company, which would be in English Antwerp Brewing Company. Ah, okay. And, and, the, and, and the Safe? Safe is our main brand or where it all started with. Um, so sometimes people call it the Safe Brewery, which is fine with me. As long as they call us, I'm already happy. But the official name of the brewery is uh, Antwerpse Brau Company. Ah, this is one of the bio. The yeah, it's one of the beer brands, yeah. And this is uh, Johan van Dijk. Yes. It, it sounds for me, for my ears, a little bit like a famous painter from yes, Flanders. Yes, yes, yes. From Antwerp. <laughs> for, <laughs> we have Anton van Dijk. He is a, he, I think he's 300 years ago or something. Uh -huh. uh, he was a very famous uh, painter. I don't have his talents, unfortunately, but uh, in my family, they say it's actually one of our ancestors. I'm not ah. sure if that's actually true, but I would like to believe so as well. <laughs> You, you brew beer, that is your uh, yes, yes, yeah, capability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, also a good art. And if you drink a lot, you might start painting. <laughs> not sure about the quality, but... Uh... So uh, tell me, how did you start the brewing or the, the uh, brewery here? Yeah, so um, almost my whole active life, I've worked in breweries. I've worked four years at the Hoogarden Brewery, you oh. might know that. Mm -hmm. uh, then I worked in Holland for three and a half years at the Dommels Brewery, and then seven and a half years at the Duvel Mordkant Group, where I was responsible for the different breweries in Belgium, but also abroad. So beer has always been my thing. Antwerp is also uh, our home city here, one of my passions. And more or less by coincidence, those two came together in a book that I found at the city library called The History of Brewing in Antwerp. It's a small book that somebody published at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And to be honest, at that point I had no clue that Antwerp has such a rich brewing history. There used to be over 100 breweries in the city center alone. So over 100? Over 100. Not only did Antwerp have a lot of breweries, it also had its own historical beer style. And that's where we come to safe. Ah, that's um, the safe. And so I was reading in this book and the author starts by saying, well actually, Antwerp has its own uh, brewing style, but unfortunately it disappeared in the beginning of the 20th century. A few things happened. First of all, you had end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, big industrial breweries started to emerge. Mm -hmm. The competition was really difficult with the bigger breweries. Then in 1914, there was a war in Belgium, uh, the First World War. And the invading troops who came to, uh, to Antwerp saw three big industrial breweries who were there, which had a lot of capacity. And then about a hundred smaller breweries, which made beer styles like, like safe, they didn't really understand. But what they did understand was that all those small breweries were packed with copper kettles and copper pipes and everything. And so the troops said, oh, we can use all those metals to turn into bullets and weapons. So they closed down all the small breweries to take away the metal. To, also the horses were confiscated. And so really in two weeks times, all those small breweries were closed, dismantled. And, and they stopped producing. And with that, almost all breweries that made safe, those were the traditional breweries that were closed, uh, disappeared. Some of them started again after the First World War, but 30 years later, the same visitors, let's call them, visited Antwerp again and said, <laughs> oh, that's nice, you bought a new kettle, thank you. And they took it again and then it was completely gone. And so I read about this in the book that I found in the city library. I tracked down the author who wrote the book, who's actually now a tour guide in our brewery as well. It, it became one of my friends. And this is about 11 years ago. What he told was, it's an old beer style. It was really famous. It actually was so uh -huh. famous that in the 19th century, and even today, a part of Antwerp is called Safehoek. And that's Dutch for uh, corner of safe or neighborhood of safe. So a whole neighborhood was named after the beer. This beer style. Apparently they drank quite a lot of beer there. It was where the harbor people were living. Um, so really famous, but not only did all those small breweries disappear, also the recipe had gone missing. I read about this and I said, well, if over 100 breweries, at least for a few hundred years, made this style of beer, it's just a matter of tracking it down and you have the recipe. It cannot be that difficult. Boy, was I wrong. It took me, <laughs> it took me three years to track it down. Uh, I looked in the city archives, um, uh, talked to people, uh, families that used to own breweries. I even visited all the retirement homes where the old people stayed, looking for old brewers and no young guys of 70 years old, at least 80 or 90 years old. After uh, three years, I tracked down a family who really had all the detailed recipes. And then finally, I had the original recipe of Safe. Having an old recipe, there were a few challenges. 
one of the challenges uh, was that the yeast, eh, every beer has its own yeast. Oh. And the second uh, challenge was I had the recipe, but it was written on uh, equipment of more than 100 years ago. So the recipe that yeah. I tracked down was from the 1870s. And luckily, all the equipment of today is completely different from 100 years ago. But to give you a very easy to understand example, if in the recipe they say we put the, the heat maximum for 45 minutes, as a brewer, you need to know, okay, how quickly does the temperature rise? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after 45 minutes, do you then end up at 63 degrees or 70 or 72? That changes the whole profile of your beer. So uh, I talked to the university at Leuven. They have a specialty in brewing, biochemics and brewing. And actually the professor there, he, was, he knew about SAFE and he was really happy that I tracked down the recipe. And for them, translating the old equipment to really values, that was easy because I knew what they had in terms of equipment. And what I didn't anticipate is they also have a yeast bank at the University of Leuven collecting um, since the beginning of the 20th century yeast strains, not only for beer, but also for other foods. And they had the original yeast. They didn't have the recipe, but they did have the yeast. Uh, so we brewed it for the first time in almost a century and we tasted it and I said, wow, I really like this. This is part of Belgian brewing history. This is part of my city's brewing history. This is different from the existing Belgian beers. And to be honest, somewhere in the back of my head, I had this dream of one day starting my own brewery that was Many, maybe on your list as well, on my bucket list, it was somewhere in the top. I said, okay, this is as good as it gets. If I ever want to start a brewery, I have an original recipe with history in my home city. So if I ever want to do it, this is it. Obviously, I also had a very, very, very long list of reasons not to do it. I had a good job. We have a mortgage to pay. We have three kids. The beer markets, especially in Belgium, there are a lot of very yeah, good beers, yeah. very, uh, a lot of breweries who make excellent beer, have a lot of uh, uh, money, a lot of marketing, a lot of salespeople in the market. Uh, eight out of 10 bars in Belgium are owned by bigger breweries or under contract, so you cannot even sell your beer there. So we had a very, very long list of reasons why it's a stupid idea. So we said, we need at least three reasons if we want to do this. So we had to be creative. First of reason was, uh, <laughs> it's our dream. Huh? So that's reason one. You cannot buy bread with a dream, but at least it's a start. The second was, um, Prior to starting my own brewery, I was responsible for the Belgium uh, breweries of Duval Morton, but also for one of the breweries in the US. So I spent a lot of time in the US as well. And there I saw that a small brewery, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. If you make sure that you make unique beers and you make sure that your quality is, is top, then you stand the chance. And the third reason was, we said, okay, if we launch this, there are three scenarios. First scenario, we try it and it works, you know, we survive. Not very likely, but it's possible. The second scenario, we try it, and it doesn't work for whatever reason, we lose everything. So the house and everything, no job, no money, whatever. Very painful scenario. But it seemed to us less painful than scenario three, where we end up being 80 years old and regretting never living that life of starting our own dream. Uh -huh. And so okay. it's okay, the, the worst yeah. thing that could happen to us, even worse than losing everything we own, is ending up at the end of your life saying, oh, I wish I would have done it. I wish I would have followed my dream. So we said, okay, you only live once. Um, Let's try it anyway. So that's uh, when we started seven years ago. Great And that's story. how we started our own, uh, our own <laughs> brewery. It's only my wife and I who own the brewery. Well, actually, we own all the, all the debt we have with yeah. the banks. <laughs> but that's uh, what's in the name. But we're not part of a bigger brewing group. Uh, there are no mm -hmm. investor, bankers, or venture capitalists behind the scenes, which is often the case with smaller breweries and they don't communicate about it. We wanted to be independent, but obviously we didn't have the money to buy a brewery. And the bank said, well, okay, you have a very good reputation in terms of, of, of brewing. Um, and if we wanted, we had investors who wanted to come on board because my prior uh, experience in breweries, but then we wouldn't only have uh, had like 10 or 11% of the shares. So we said, want to be independent. So luckily uh, being at the time already for uh, 15 years in the brewing industry, I have a lot of friends in brewing industry and some of them inherit breweries. And one of my friends said, well, what you're planning to do is completely crazy, but I want to help you out. You can start brewing in our brewery, but as soon as possible, you're out. And uh, let's, let's be very clear about this. And also for me, I didn't want to become the, the, no, the, the, the yeah, yeah, 10 the... million contract brewer uh, forever. That was at the Roman Brewery, which is an uh, old brewery in uh, Belgium. And that's where we started brewing seven years ago, but with a very clear uh, ambition to prove to the banks and everybody else that's, and to ourselves as well, uh -huh, that uh, we know how to brew beer, yeah. that people actually like our beers and that there is a place for us in the market. After a few, few years, we didn't have uh, enough money to buy a brewery, obviously, but at least we could prove to the bank that we knew what we were doing. 
And then the bank said, okay, we will loan you uh, the rest of the money on one uh, condition, part of the money you have to find yourself. So we had a little bit of money saved, but then we launched a, a crowdfunding campaign. On the wall, there are some of the crowdfunders, actually over a thousand people participated. Because our biggest nightmare is uh, if we start selling shares, that somebody starts buying them mm -hmm. in mass and becomes a shareholder who has 20% and then starts controlling our company. So what we wanted to do was uh, make sure that people in, who invest in our, in our brewery, they get something in return which makes them happy and we avoid that um, uh, we get into the hands of a, a big brewery. So if they uh, sponsored us for at least 150 euro, they can come in for the rest of their lives and have a free beer every month. Um, uh, so. <laughs> 150 euros and you get free beer worth 30, 40 euros per year. So that's a good return on investment. <laughs> Obviously, you have to be a very sad and lonely person to come all alone every month, drink your one beer and go home. So what happens is they come over with their family and friends yeah. and they have lots of beer. So, And it's their brewery in, in certain times. They come in and say, yeah. hi, I'm, uh, I can all the names. I'm Dennis, I'm Mark, I'm whoever. I say, hi, Mark, hi, Dennis. And you know, it's their brewery for their friends. And that's how, uh, with their help, and our little savings and a lot of loans from the bank, we were able to build this brewery. Which is very impressive. You like it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's bigger than I uh, expected. Okay. Uh, actually, our, our whole philosophy is being a, a small brewery will never be a price player. We have to make original beers, but we can also not do a huge marketing campaigns. We actually have no money for marketing. We make some beer mats and some glasses. You have your own beer mats, so you know <laughs> that's doable, but uh, so big marketing campaigns. Uh, that's, uh, about here. Yeah, and we have our own ones as well, here you see. Great design. Um, yeah, it's a little bit. Yeah, we don't even have money for designers, so we, we, we make that ourselves. Oh, and we have a friend who do some, does some paintings. Um, that's, I like the paintings. <laughs> yeah, so he's a very good, uh, he's a hobby painter, so he makes the drawings. Okay. And then I took one day of Photoshop uh, course, a day course, and then I know how to put this on a beer mat and that's enough. Uh, so that's the life of a small brewery. Our philosophy is we have to be better than what is normal in the market, be above in terms of quality. And that's also why we uh, chose to invest in really top quality uh, brewing equipment. That's, uh, yeah. so that's why they're so nice toys here. <laughs> So let's have a look at this toy. Yes, let's go into the, into the brewery. <laughs> it's a German built uh, brew house. Yeah. Uh, they took away so many breweries in Antwerp, at least they could put one back. So it's um, a two vessel brew house. This kettle is the mash kettle, but also the boiling kettle. So when we start the brewing that's over there, we start milling. Everything comes through the uh, blue yep. pipes so the grain comes in there, it's mixed with water, and then we start mashing it in, so driving up the temperature, uh, depending on the recipe, starting at 45 or 50 or 60, uh, and step by step um, heating it up so that the starch is turned into sugar. Then we transfer everything to the second kettle, which is nothing more than just a, a filter kettle. Yep. Uh, so a Lauterton in, a, yeah. in a plain English. Yeah. One of the things that many uh, visitors don't really uh, fully appreciate, but if you have to run a brewery, you fully appreciate it. So it's, there's a lot of automation here. And the most important thing is that what's left over after filtration, so I don't know, the spent grains in English, it's automatically transferred outside. In some small breweries, you really have to shovel everything into mm -hmm. buckets and carry it outside. If this is automated, you get a smile on the brewer's face. Uh, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, I so, know. I know such breweries where they. Yeah, and they, it, it looks nice on some pictures when you see yeah, the. Yeah. <laughs> but if you have to do it uh, twice or three times a day, you you know the yeah, romance drops quickly. Tons, in the, tons of yeah, material. So, um, <laughs> and then it's transferred back to the first kettle, uh, which then serves as a, a boiling kettle. Yeah. Um, so with the two millas, the the capacity per brew is 40 hectoliters, so 4,000 liters, which for us is ideal. It is a, a fully automated brew house, so every valve, every meter, yeah. uh, all the uh, fermentation tanks, everything is um, controlled from here. So you put in the recipes and it, 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 it controls everything. And one of the things is, for example, if we mill the day before, and sometimes we start brewing at 2 or 3 a.m., um, but luckily we're still in bed, so we can just say, okay, start transferring uh, everything here, start mashing in. And we walk in at seven in the morning and then we do some controls when it's filtering. With one person can do two brews and doesn't have a 20 hour work day. And what's the meaning of this person? 
So the, the guy, ah, this is the... That's the guy from Safe. Actually, it's the, uh, the icon of a brewery that existed until the 1940s in Antwerp. So the brewery disappeared and we need the logo for a brewery. And since our brewery also started with an historical beer from Antwerp, we figured we would also um, have like an old visual from a, uh, from a brewery again. So it's his second life as an icon of a brewery. <laughs> and it was only for Safe at the beginning. But then we said, okay, people recognized him as, uh, uh, as the icon from our brewery. Uh, so then he turned into a sailor for our second beer, Boches beer. And then as a monk for our more Trappist style beer. And now it's a bit like um, yeah, a running joke that he always comes back in a different form with a different beer. Some special things about the brewery. If you look at the chimneys, there might be something uh, which strikes you as a bit odd. Yeah. <laughs> they don't go outside. It's actually just for show. Why? We are in the middle of the city mm -hmm. and one of our major concerns was we're, uh, this is an active, a really full production brewery, but we have people whose, um, whose bedrooms is, is really literally five meters from our brew house. Ah. So how can we avoid having problems for the neighbors in terms of smells, in terms of sounds and everything? Um, so what we do is all the vapor we make uh, is condensed. So there's a system, the pipe you see at the right or the left side of the kettle. Ah, yeah, yeah. Everything's transferred and condensed. So there's no odor outside for the neighbors. Mm -hmm. But also this fits in our, in our philosophy in terms of uh, environmental uh, friendly production. So we um, reuse all the energy which yeah. is normally just blown outside. If a traditional brewery has a big cloud of uh, steam going outside, that's all energy lost we turn that energy back into hot water for the second brew or for other processes. Um, this is here inside. Yeah, so we, we, we make um, uh, 50 or 60 hectoliters of hot water from the vapor we have from uh -huh. the previous brew. So these two tanks, so the upper part is the hot water tank uh -huh. and the lower part is the whirlpool. Ah, so after it's combined? Yeah, so it's, uh, we're, we're in the city center, so we have to use the space as efficiently yeah, as yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, um, it's stacked on top of each other, let's say. Now this is the more traditional whirlpool system, but we specifically chose this one because one of the things we want to do is, uh, often we add hops or spices after boiling. If you add the hops during boiling, it will not only transfer the aromas into the beer, but also the bitterness. If you do it post boiling, so below 100 degrees, which is during uh, the whirlpool, we can add hops and then the beer is transferred inside and that way, you do get the aromas, but you don't get that much bitterness. There's still some transfer of bitterness, but a lot less than during boiling. So that's a way more flexibility to add aromas and play with it. If you want to have the bitterness and, and the aromas, we do it in the boil. If we don't want it, you can do it here. So that's really um, something good. The fermenters, they are 120 hectoliters and 80 hectoliters. Uh, for those who are more technical, there's a reasoning behind all of this. First of all, it's more or less the maximum height we could put in into the building. And combined with uh, a brew house of 40 hectoliters, if you have fermenters of 120 hectoliters, you can um, add new brews in a certain time span. Imagine we would have uh, um, a brew house which is only 20 hectoliters, then we could not fill up a 120 hectoliter uh, fermenter. You have 30, 35 hours max. If a fermentation is in its growth phase, you can add new warts to it. So within 30 hours, we can make three brews and fill up the full tank. And that's why we have the combination of 120 hectoliter uh, fermentation tanks with 40 hectoliter brew house. On the right, we have uh, pressure tanks. As you can see, it's an active brewery, so uh, there's a lot of uh, flexibles. <laughs> if, if you have enough budget, you can put everything in stainless steel. Yeah. Uh, but for us, it's a, a lot of flexibles. Uh, <laughs> the small fermenter you see there in the end, yeah. that's actually our yeast storage tank. Ah. So, um, for example, the yeast of safe, we can storage it there and then reuse it afterwards. I don't know if you want to see the, the separator, the loudest machine, is the most expensive square meter from our brewery. So after fermentation and lagering, we have to make sure if we add extra hops for dry hopping and the yeast after fermentation, that we get it out. It's a, a turning, a, a spinning um, a plate. The beer is transferred through it. And you, by playing with the speed that the beer goes through, but also the speed it turns, you can really uh, push out either the yeast or the hop particles or whatever. But the base, is, base liquid isn't changed. So the, the advantage is you keep all the aroma and flavor in. The disadvantage, if you think it's a disadvantage, our beers will never be as clear as an industrially filtered beer. But for me, that's not such a big deal. It's, it's still clear enough. 
but you can get all the yeast out and everything. If you have too much yeast load in your beer, it will end up going bad. You'll, you'll get what they call autolysa, which gives a, a, a bad uh, smell and flavor to the beer, and your beer will go bad very quickly. So we want to make sure that our beers stay fresh. Now those machines, they're not new technology, they exist for decades probably, but having it after fermentation, that's relatively new in breweries, because up to a few years ago, the disadvantage of those machines was that they picked up oxygen. Ah. And so if you add oxygen prior to fermentation, that's not the end of the world, because the, the yeast will pull out the, 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 the oxygen. If you do it after fermentation, the oxygen stays in, and oxy oxygen, that's what causes your beer to go old and, and, uh, and deteriorate. So you have to make sure uh, there's no oxygen. And those, the new uh, type of machines, they don't have that, uh, that problem. Sometimes That's people fair. think this is a, a small brewery or a yeah, brewery. Yeah, it could be, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, no. it's called a sip or in English, cleaning in ah, place. It's cleaning, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the left tank is a, a really aggressive acid. Yeah. So if you open it, you end up with no hand. <laughs> um, the right one is, uh, in Dutch it's called log, I don't know the English word, so an aggressive soap, let's say. And so the biggest challenge in brewing is making sure that everything stays sterile, there's no infections, there's no micro bio, bio, microorganisms anywhere. So we have to clean everything, so the acid is to make sure there's no uh, um, uh, leftovers in the site, soap as well. And then there's also a system with steam, so we make everything always sterile and uh, clean. It's not fully automated, but it's, uh, so you still have to uh, play with the valves. My colleague Dries is a lot more, is better in that than I am. So that's why there's uh, stickers everywhere saying which one goes to which pipe, because <laughs> I often uh, end up uh, making mistakes, so. And here is the... And that's our check filling line, filo. a small machine. So everything else in the brewery is, is German built. This is the only Belgian built a machine. The CEO of this company lives 50 meters from the brewery. And when we heard, we were actually installing um, uh, an Austrian kegging line here. And when he heard about this, he almost died of uh, sorrow. So he contacted me and said, Johan, you cannot do this. I live 50 meters from you. You know, what are you doing? I said, make me an offer I can't refuse. And he made me a really good offer. The, the belly of a brew house. The hidden space of, yeah, which, of hey, the brew and house. And that's a bit the whole philosophy here in our brewery. You can see uh, a real brewery uh -huh. in action. And actually, we're moving the bar. So this part will also be open. Which is interesting, I, I would find this interesting to see how, how, how everything works. The downside is, or for us, we have to make sure, and you have to do that anyway, but everything has to be 100% clean all the time. You cannot mm. say, oh, the floor is dirty. You know what, it's late, I'm going on, I'll do that tomorrow. No, because there are people in the bar that say, oh, what's that on the floor? So we have to uh -huh. make sure everything uh -huh. is clean all the time. Um, and this is, this is cool, this is the back. That's the, the backstage of the bar. The backstage of yeah. the bar is a... Which we will Tax. also move, because that's one of the disadvantages. It's, um, uh, we don't, we don't uh, pre-cool the kegs. Ah. And in winter, no problem. But in summer, when it's warm, then you have the brew house up a few, on a few yeah, meters. Yeah, yeah. That was a bad idea to put them here. So yeah. uh, in terms of <laughs> the quality of the beer, the yeah. Suit, the suit house yeah, so that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that was a stupid idea. So that's why we are moving the bar. We're putting a uh, cool tank so the beer is cooled and also a big fridge where the mm -hmm. kegs can mm -hmm. be stored mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. So um, don't try this at home, bad idea. <laughs> so let's move to the front of the bar. <laughs> yes. Our philosophy is we have to be different, make different styles. We don't follow the trends. We don't look for extremes that people say, wow, this is really special, I've never tried. It has to be an accessible, but what we say, uh, rememberable. If you taste one of our beers, if you have a Boches beer, an amber red ale, and tomorrow I give you a line of 10 amber red ales and our beer is in, in there, it will not be difficult to say, okay, that's the one I had yesterday. So it has to be distinct, it has to be different. No extremes, accessible beers, nice flavors, in balance. Um, so that's what we try to do.